you know that that year where we had about six weeks to um pull together you know a group of extra players um in our roster and um you know we're calling players who are literally in the pub <laughs> um with their feet up uh, and then bring them into place and then to win three games that season you know is probably the biggest achievement through that time I think you know given given the circumstances so and even in the difficult times inside the club it was a, it was a good place to be that we were all um, in it together and working hard together to um do what we do what we love to do hello ladies and gentlemen welcome back to the working in sport podcast my name is James Grigson and today we have a doozy for you our special guest today is Justin Crow Justin currently is the head of high performance for the Melbourne Victory Football or Soccer Club, depending on what part of the world you're in. Justin has had an extensive career across sport. Firstly, actually as an AFL footballer, at the beginning of the 2000s, Justin went on to get a physiotherapy degree, worked in private practice, then went on to work within the high-performance program at the Collingwood Football Club, spent a significant time of his career with the Essendon Football Club and largely as the head of high performance during that program throughout the majority of the 2010s. He then went on to work at Paralympics Australia as head of high performance and then now obviously with the victory. Not only has this man had extensive practical experience, but also is very well read, very well studied, has a number of ma- a couple of master's degrees, a PhD, and then obviously the Bachelor in Physiotherapy that we mentioned before. I really enjoyed this chat. We weren't really so much on the ins and outs of football or the, the nitty gritty of sports science. It was really about some of the decision making and the st- decision making processes that Justin made and lessons learned from those decisions throughout his time, just over 20 years in the industry. There's a lot of nuggets in here. I really hope you enjoy the interview. Today's episode is brought to you by JTG Media, business growth specialist. JTG Media helps with sales and marketing activities for service-based businesses. So if you're looking to increase your brand's presence or increase the number of sales that you have for your service business, JTG Media will be able to help. That's jtgmedia.org, business growth specialist. Let's get to the show. I look through your your resume, obviously very well-educated man, a man with a lot of experience across private practice, Olympic, also pro sport. But the thing that jumps off the page actually is undefeated in AFL football. One, one game, one win, mate. Not many people, <laughs> not many people can get to AFL level, but not many people can go undefeated as well. So, um, mate, I thought I'd start off with that because that's the, the biggest thing that jumped off the page, Justin. Um, from a from a S and C coach perspective, sports scientist, high performance perspective, how important do you think it is, or do you believe it to be that the coaches had to have Walked the talk in some sense. I'm not saying that every S&C high performance sports science has to have played AFL football, but in your mind, do you think it's important for some level of physicality had taken place, some level of training and, and actual understanding of, of the training that takes place to be able to lead the athletes appropriately? Yeah, you know what I think is important? And I think that there's some research in this around um, Premier League coaches, or at least there was an article about it, about it's really important when leading people or um, I suppose having a role of responsibility within a club uh, to be seen as one of us. Um, so that sort of goes a really long way in um, in creating an environment where people you know are, are comfortable with a leader and also um, to, to give validity to what to what they say. And I think you, you know you see a lot of coaches who played and that type of thing and I'm sure it's helpful but it, it's in no way um, essential I don't think however um, it, it is quite important I think for practitioners to be aware of um, yeah yeah that having some connection and, and for, for you know their, their clients and athletes to um, in some way feel like they're um, yeah connected or uh, have an understanding of what they're going through yeah because there's a and I phrased the question deliberately around sports science high performance practitioners because obviously there's, um, I understand there has been some research and obviously some media debate in terms of coach selection, like has has he or she played before, uh, comes up a lot, especially in the media. But from a, when you mentioned the one of us mentality, what do you what do you mean by that? Like from, from what you've read and what you've experienced, if someone, let's say, hasn't had an extreme athletic background, 
um, and they want to be, and they might feel a level of imposter syndrome, or they might feel like they haven't walked the talk appropriately to be able to lead, and that's something that's on their mind. How, in your experience, does someone you know create that one of us mentality with the athletes that they're trying to lead? Yeah, so I think what that can look like is um, at times um, demonstrating, um, you know, through through actions that you um, you know, you can, you can do what the athlete can do, or, or perhaps using stories as, as a tool to, to demonstrate um, an, an understanding of what they might have been through. Um, you know, like. Um, in, in a high performance management role, as an example, it is it, good sometimes to um, use your physio skills um, around the physios. Or, um, yeah, if a massage service doesn't turn up, just get on the tools and, and um, get get that done, as an example. Or um, step in for the S and C um, and help with, uh, with with some coaching and that type of thing. You know, not not, not to um, not to do people's job for them, but but just as a little bit of a reminder, I suppose that. Um, there's, you know, that that you you do know what's going on, and um, you are uh, in, um, yeah, you know, connected in, in that way. Yeah, you're happy to to sweep the sheds or or roll the sleeves up. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's really important. You know, and I'm like I, I worked in um Paralympic sport, and um, I think it is also inauthentic to pretend you can empathise with things you haven't been through. So. Um, you know, I'd recommend against that. However, um, you know, probably think about the things which are a connection between you and your athletes and or um, other staff and, and how, um, yeah, how to uh, maximise those. At the moment, obviously, you, your role of head of performance at Melbourne Victory, you have some players currently playing in the, the Women's Football World Cup, um, three, one, one with the Matildas, one with New Zealand, one with Denmark we're discussing off air. So, I understand that your role is club wide, so you may not necessarily have an extreme involvement with the women's program, but I'd like you to, you know, just as a, a question of curiosity in your time, having dealt with players going on to international duties, whether it be, you know, back when they used to play in the AFL um, against the Irish for the Gaelic tournaments, or, or especially now in scenarios where men's or women's players are going off to world cup or international duties. What are some of the things that, that you, um, manage during that are you close with the players is it uh, more about a relationship with the international staff that is dealing with them and then what are the things that you are focusing on with the players that are remaining does much change during that time frame where you've got some of your more you know your stars away on international duty talk us through the processes there managing international breaks yeah it's a really good question i think there's always a tension between clubs and um you know national programs we um do our best and we would put a lot of effort at the Melbourne Victory to um, be closer and communicate better with the national programs um, because it, it works both ways. You know, we um, feel more confident and um, have a trust, you know, that the athletes are looked after when they're, um, you know, away on national camp or, or playing or that type of thing and, and also that they're continuing to work on those aspects of their program um, that are ongoing long-term athlete development priorities for us and and likewise i think um the national teams appreciate it when, when we communicate with them well and you know, give them really good um advice on the leading about how players going uh, what they might need in a given time and um certainly the best thing for an athlete is um to have a smooth transition between different environments um so, and they can trust that communication is happening um people on the same page and, and as much as possible athletes aren't getting mixed messages so i think that that's a really important aspect um, you know, I, I think the um certainly on the women's side, the Australian um national team has been doing some really good job um and work to um yeah, to, to put that squad together and communicate. And um yeah, we are just really excited as a club to have some players involved in the World Cup and um yeah, wish wish Australia all the best and, and also those individual players other at other sides. You mentioned there's uh I think you use the word tension uh between national programs and and clubs would you consider that um and i know it's maybe a bit challenging to answer this question because you're right in the thick of it right now but do you consider that tension to be healthy like from my perspective i I see it as you know both programs are trying to do what's best for the athlete um what what do you consider what do you think of that tension at at home yeah 
It's it's really a good question. I think like you know, there's a lot of a lot, a lot of practical examples of where that tension can um arise. You know, like um sometimes these windows um only allow a couple of days before our next game. You know, so mm-hmm. it might be an international window that a player is at. Um, they'll be playing a game, you know, across the other side of the world. And then we'll be hoping or planning for that player to play 90 minutes with us um, in an important league game a couple of days later. So, you know, what gives? You know, it, it may not be in the player's best interest to play both those games. Um, if the national team doesn't give, then um, do we uh, as a club? Um, becomes an interesting question um, given the club is paying for the, you know, paying the player um, through that time. Um yeah, that, that, they're, they're sort of tensions that come up and it, it's not necessarily a reflection on um, either group of practitioners or um, the program. It's often the scheduling, um, which can create those those situations. And um, yeah, you know, and, and the only way to overcome those and get the best thing for the athlete is to um, communicate really strongly um, and openly and build trust between um, between groups, you know, like... Um, if a player had to do had to play ninety minutes before they flew um, internationally and and then return to our program. Then perhaps what could happen is a really um, thorough you know recovery process and also a um yeah a good communication about how they come out of the game so we can make the decision when they return. So they're, they're the type of things which um yeah uh, it's just really important to get ahead of and and work through and, and build trust between um between different groups. It's very easy. Um, when you're working with someone and they see someone else or go somewhere else, um, to assume the worst, or you know, if someone got um, injured in one particular environment, um, you know, to point the finger because you're not the only involved. So, and I think it's it is helpful to um build a um level of communication and trust between programs that that, that you don't feel that way. You know, you, you sort of trust that they would have been doing everything possible for the player. And um, you know, sometimes these things happen. So, yeah, that, that, that that's the sort of tension I'm talking about. Yeah, as we discussed a little bit off air, like a lot of these questions are, you know, I think that well, the purpose of 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 what I'm of the show here is there's uh, there's pathways in education for sports science and sports scientists through universities, but the some of these incidental commentaries people don't learn until they're actually in the seat. You know, so I, I love these types of uh, these questions and answers because not a lot of people, you know, that want to work, not a lot of people that want to work in sport or in, in roles such as the one that you have, you know, they, they, they're they not really getting that proper education pathway. So, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the answers on that. One one thing that um, jumped off the, the page for me was your time with the Essendon Football Club throughout the majority of the, the 2010s. And it was quite a challenging time for, for the club with the, the the supplement scandal, if you will, um, that was labelled. But what I took from reading up on your profile was, you know, during that during that time, especially as as head of high performance between 2013 and 2019, there was a lot of personal um, personal, as in for yourself, accomplishments that took place. You know, not a lot of high performance managers can say that they were able to um, keep their job while three consecutive, you know, head coach changes happened. Not a lot of um, high performance managers can say during that time that you know between 2013 and 2018 that you were below the AFL average in terms of injuries that took place considering things like the 2016 season where a lot of your players were, were delisted and you're having to bring up uh, players from from other lists to be able to get them ready for AFL football so I guess what I wanted to to do is set the table um, for that, but ultimately, what I'm curious is when you look back during that time, your time at Essendon and and the various ups and downs. Obviously, you made some finals during that time as well. What are, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about that time period at the club? Yeah, it's good. that's a really, really good question too, James. I, it, it was a slog, you know. We, we um as a, a club, it was a challenging time, and particularly for players, you know, it's um. It's because of the, the high amount of media interest at that time and personal stress um, for particular players. Um, spent a lot of time rebuilding trust between um, sports science and the playing group, and also um, you know the rest rest of the club as well. So, so really being really really big investment in um, rebuilding that trust, relationships, and getting fundamentals right. Um, 
and you know, and like we did, we had um changes of coaches for different reasons, and we had um, you know, that that year where we had about six weeks to um pull together, you know, a group of extra players um in our roster, and um you know we're calling players who are literally in the pub, <laughs> um with their feet up, uh, and then bring them into play. So, you know, in and then to win three games that season, you know, is probably the biggest achievement through that time i think you know given given the circumstances so yeah it, it was it was um never easy going but um you know it, what was really important always was to remember um that we're all there because we love what we do and, and and even in the difficult times inside the club it was a, it was a good place to be so that we were all um in it together and working hard together to um do what do what we love to do the first thing that you mentioned was was player centric uh you mentioned that it was about, you know, it was a tough time. for Obviously, it was a slog that you mentioned for the club at large, but then you quickly jumped to the players and you said it's quite hard on the players, media pressure, this, that. Um, you you come across to be quite player-focused and player-centric as a, as a high-performance leader. Why why is, you know, why do you think that you jump to, to the players so quickly when you mentioned that? And is that something, you know, from our brief conversations, you seem like a very player-first leader is that something that you've always had or is that sort of coaching that you've had externally to refocus and reframe your mind to be player player first i, I think so i mean like the the athletes are the ones who um get the job done you know so uh that they should be a lot always a lot of our focus uh i think um you know developing a care for players um an understanding of players and also um yeah so supporting them to perform you know that we don't necessarily have to be um best friends or um we don't um just have to agree all the time um but we we are there to support the players to do a really good job um you know and um get the best out of themselves and, and in their lives so so that, that I, I and i think anyone studying sports science would um have some connection with that idea i, I would expect during during working in sport in general, uh, let alone that time period for yourself at Essendon, working in sport can be quite turbulent and there's there's elements of unknown uh, pretty much at, at, all, at all times in terms of things like job security, uh, especially um, me knowing that that is one of the you know high stresses for people working in the industry. What were some of the things that you might have been, what are some of the things that you were telling yourself or you were telling others during that time frame, during such a turbulent time frame to stay to try and stay focused at the task at hand and, and to stay centered and, and not, you know, let your mind, you know, run away with some of the thoughts that this turbulence would have created. Yeah. You know, you know what the first thing is, and that's turn up. So I, I really believe often, um, you know, actions are really important. So you, you just get out of bed and you turn up um, and then, you know, you eat the elephant one bite at a time. So it's, um, but by turning up and being around each other and, um, you know, having a, a similar vision or, or, you know, alignment in terms of what, what we want to achieve and we want to get to, then um, that, that that's pretty central, I think. Um, but, you know, um, I would just say to everyone, you know, regardless of how tough it is or how much you might be doubting how it's going, um, the first thing to do is, is show up and then, um, yeah, the, the rest the rest can... um flow from there just one more question on that time period i hope you don't uh, mind me asking too much about that time period but certainly very interesting i think the uh the labeling of uh, the name of sports science took took a bash during that time period not only maybe like you, you sort of alluded to at the club but you know in industry-wide um you say what you will about you know, and, and obviously because that that phrase job title was used throughout the media um what do you think, you know, what were some of the things that you did to try and build that trust back between yourself and the athletes? But then also, um, what do you think that impact had on the industry at large? Do you think that, like, you know, from my perspective, it, it seems like it's relatively over, you know, it seems well over um, in terms of the the impact that it did have. But from your perspective, obviously being on the inside, what do you think that that incident did to, I guess, the, the industry and sports scientists and people outside the industry looking in at what we do? Yeah, I think there's been, um, I mean, as an example, I think for memory, there, there were less than 100 accredited sports scientists with SA at the time, um, you know, and, and that 
has now um, created an impetus for a stronger framework um, for accreditation, you know, as larger importance placed on being accredited. Um, you know, that even in like, yeah, the, the protocols around um, use of supplements and protocols around um, how we run a safe um, program and all those type of things. I think there's been progress in all those, the understanding of all those areas as well, um, particularly in professional sport. So it's, um, yeah, yeah, look, you know, the, the, the reputational damage, um, yeah, was, was something that I, I suspect, you know, occurred at the time. However, um, yeah, there's been um, a lot of good work since then to uh, really rebuild, um, yeah, the, the industry and, and the people within it. And, um, and I mean, people within sport have always understood the importance. It's really just, um, yeah, getting that broad, un broad understanding out there in the community about um, the work sports scientists can do. Yeah, and appreciate those answers on those questions. Uh, when I look look at your resume, it's a lot of practical experience, but also see an academic, mate. Like from from your bachelor degree uh, in physiotherapy to to masters in exercise science, and then also a masters from the Melbourne Business School, and then a PhD in physiotherapy. And it's not just it's not like you did all that study bang in the early two thousands and you went off and had your career. You were you were spot you know in in spots collecting these. Um, uh, these education certificates on your way through your career. Why why was that so important to you? Yeah, it's going like I mean I think um I do a lot of study in parallel with my work, which which is a really good way to do things because it um you have somewhere to put the learning because the knowledge that's coming in, you know, you can um be trying things and also better understanding um the theory because of you yeah, being embedded in the practice. So I mean like going back um in time you know a master's was something you did after you've been working for a while you know you, you do, do a master's um it includes a um a, a masterpiece you know something that you present to um you know the senior people within your industry um to show your worth and um you know get get to that level as a, a master of your profession so i know it's not always feasible for people but, but it is um ideal to in some ways to be um yeah combining that extra study um with um with with practical work it, it, even if it has to be voluntary or even if it has to be um you know not necessarily the, the dream job it is really useful to be um getting your hands dirty while taking the information I think was that something that you was that a bit of a like a self discovery or is that something that a mentor might have mentioned to you on the way yeah I, I can't remember where I picked that up. I did sort of um, read a little bit about, you know, how masterpieces and I find all that sort of stuff kind of interesting, you know, like, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing just to consider, you know, what, if you're, what would your masterpiece be? <laughs> how, um, you know, I did a um, ACL rehab recently with uh, one of our women's players and, um, yeah, like if I had to present a masterpiece at the moment, it would be, it would be that one probably, you know, um, but um yeah, I, I sort of think um, it can become a little bit of a function of how many people graduate exercise science and how few jobs there are that, that, that a lot of a lot of us go in there and study more straight away. Um, however, yeah, I, I think that traditional model is, is a better one. I uh, you took you took my next question by mentioning what your masterpiece was. Um, I'm by no means an ACL expert, and and this show isn't necessarily about the nitty gritty of of sports science practices and return to play. But if you can, um, what made that particular ACL rehab a masterpiece in your mind? Yeah, so th there's a bit of a general acceptance that someone's season after they do an ACL rehab might be impacted. I think sometimes you know it's often. Um, an excuse, and not not necessarily an excuse, but often it's a um something that's observed that it can take someone a season to really get their full confidence back and fitness back and get back to like they were. So um yeah, with, with this particular player, um we we just decided because we had the time that we just would do that extra year in in the um in the current year. You know, we just do double, just do lot, lots of extra work. Um. And yeah, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to work this player most days of the week. Um, 
we, yeah, just worked really hard, got super strong, um, did a lot of uh, functional work early, a lot of plyometric work early, and um, it, it all came together. Um, the player went on and played every minute of the last um, A-League women's season, um, and, and, you know, in the top in the top few of our best and fairest. So it was a, um, yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily just the outcome, which makes something a masterpiece, I suppose, but but it was something where I, I really felt like I could do the absolute, there was nothing holding us back. We did things the best way we possibly could and uh, got a good result. Yeah, it's a, certainly a good feeling when all when, when it all comes together from a, you know, inception point of view or, or the creation of it. Obviously, in that sense, it's the it's the rehab, but then the actual execution, like you mentioned, the player playing every minute, that, that must feel really good, especially with those things coming together. What what I saw from from your resume is uh, a, a person that's able to to jump through different uh, sub domains or sub niches within the the niche that is sport. And what I mean by that is not many people um, will say that they worked in private practice and then at AFL football at, at the elite level, but then also uh, in soccer or or football globally at the elite level. And then also across Paralympic programs, there's such a, you know, like I said, not many people make those jumps. They normally find one sport and for, for most of their career stick in that, or they might jump into another one that's kind of similar, you know, rugby league to AFL as an example. What do you think is the biggest um, or the most important transferable skill as a practitioner for yourself to be able to jump through those certain sub niches? Yeah, good one. I, I think, um, there's some intrinsic things like just loving to help athletes and you know being really strong on physiology and some of the um you know the core knowledge that that is transferable. However, the probably the most important thing is to be able to work with a coach, um to, to be able to walk into a new environment, um listen, um understand, um relate to, and and then be able to support um support a coach um yeah that that would have to be one of the most important skills to be able to transfer between environments i think what are some of the key questions that you're asking coaches then when you're walking into different environments to help understand them yeah i mean like i walked into the a-league not not being an expert on football um so yeah just asking questions all the time um you know, about how and why and also, you know, applying, being prepared to offer expertise in the area we're experts in, you know, and not and respecting that there are experts in the game itself um, all around us. So I think, um, yeah, there's just really like listening and, and picking up the language quickly and being able to, um, yeah, add value by... Um, by being able to fit in and, and and actually work within a you know a different environment can be really important. Just at, at the end of every uh, interview, I ask the guest what what would their you know one advice be to someone starting out in sports science today. Obviously, the industry has has changed a bit and evolved, and you're mentioning that um, even when you were talking about the different degrees, you know, uh, and how people go about approaching their education versus their uh, approaching their practical work, but. What would be your one piece of advice to people starting out in sports science today? My advice to a lot of people is to do your time and to be prepared um, to do your time. You know, I um, there was one period in AFL when I sort of looked across our staff and, and everyone um, we'd employed, whether it be you know sports science medicine team, everyone had done some time in either TAC Cup, which is under eighteen. Um, Competition in Australian rules, or um, or the VFL, which is the second tier level in Australian rules. So, um, you know, everyone who at that level at that time, um, had done time at a lower level. You know, so, um, and my belief is, and it might not be true all the time, but my belief is that if if you do your time and you do a good job, um, and have enough patience, then most people get their chance. Um. And it's um yeah, and it's really what sets people apart, you know, um, being prepared to work hard for not a lot um, and do a really good job um, for enough time as it takes for, for that chance to come can be um can can be challenging. It's not for everyone, but that that is um that, that is the thing which tends to give people their 
um, set people apart. If someone was to ask, okay, well, you know, how much time is that? I, I know from having spoken to a fair few people that that time does vary from from club to club, sport, sport opportunity to opportunity. But you know, if someone is preparing themselves to put to put in that effort how long should they be putting, you know, how long should they be preparing? Or is it a case of if you want it, you just need to be putting in the effort for as long as it takes? Yeah, it's such a hard question. Um, I think think part of the issue is it's not that obvious, you know, you sort of don't just finish your one-year internship and then um, something Mm -hmm. comes up, you know, it might. Um, But the second year might be when the timing really clicks or or the the coach you've got a good relationship with makes progression in their career. And you can um go along with them, or um you know that great relation, that great job you did with a certain player um means that they're t- they're talking about you to another club, or mm. um you know it it can be very hard to put a finger on exactly how long, but you know but by um working hard, um being a good person and, and doing your time, um and continuing continuing to improve, so that when you do get that opportunity, um. You are ready to do do a really good job. Um, yeah, I, 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 my experience is in most cases that happens. Um, the opportunity comes, but um, yeah, it could take it could take years. Justin, I really appreciate your time today. I know we uh, know we've got a hard stop. So for those that are watching and they enjoyed, they can watch our previous interview here. If you'd like to subscribe to the channel, you can click down here. For Justin, I'm James. Have a great day. Thanks a lot, James. Thanks for having me.